I am just here to welcome you and to introduce Stephen Director, who is the Provost of Northeastern University, who will give a few opening remarks and a formal welcome. And that will be followed by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who will tell you a little bit about the Institute, and then we'll get going. Dr. Director. Thanks, David. So I also want to officially welcome you. I guess he said this is the formal, formal welcome. Uh, according to, I was talking to David last night, and he commented that he thought that this was the first, or certainly one of the very first times when researchers that are both interested in technology and emotion are getting together in the same room at the same time. Uh, we hear a lot about social networks, and we have one of the key social networking uh, group, a representative from Facebook, one of the key social networking activities here. But um, when we talk about social networks, I guess we think mostly about people interacting with people and not people interacting with machines. Uh, and you know, I don't know about you, but one of the things that I really appreciate when I get into my car and use my GPS system is that she, and it's a female voice, so I refer to her as she, uh, doesn't get upset with me when I ignore her or I make a wrong turn. She, by the way, also doesn't applaud when I get to where I'm going, but, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, there's, that's a simple interaction. And one of the things I enjoy most is interacting with Siri uh, because um, uh, she does us usually provide me um, good information. Again, she doesn't get upset with me, but I do get upset with her when she doesn't understand me. So uh, I think as we move forward, there's going to be a greater need to uh, put emotion into the technology we use and, and also for the people that develop technology to have a better understanding how it impacts us as we use it. So I think this is a really timely topic, a very interesting topic. It's, I think it it's, uh, epitomizes one of the things we at Northeastern uh, like to do, and that's work on the, on the boundaries between traditional disciplines and see where things could, could uh, we could benefit from each other by working on those boundaries. So we do a lot of interdisciplinary stuff here. We also work uh, in areas we call use-inspired research, things that really matter to society. And these kinds of activities, I think, matter a lot to society. So thanks very much for coming. I hope you all have a great, great time here. I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing how this all comes out. Thanks very much. So let me welcome you all here today. Thank you for coming, especially the people who came from a distance. My name is Lisa Feldman Barrett, and uh, I am a professor of psychology here at Northeastern University. Um, and I am also uh, the director of the Affective Science Institute. And it's my job this morning, in a brief amount of time, supposed to be five minutes, but it'll probably be more like seven. That was not, nobody laughed. That was like an academic joke, <laughs> academics going, okay, anyways. Um, it's my job uh, to orient you um, not only well, to the question of um, what is affect and why do we have an institute for it. So I'm your academic interlude uh, for somewhere between five and ten minutes. Um, uh, and so because some of you may not really uh, know uh, what affect is in, in the broadest sense. And so just to give you a sense of that, um, uh, and because I'm your academic interlude, I'm going to give you an entire history of psychology in one slide so that you understand what's so innovative about what we're doing here. As many of you know, uh, psychology uh, became a science when neurologists and physiologists attempted to look for the physical basis of thoughts and feelings. So uh, in uh, mental philosophy for hundreds of years, philosophers had talked about um, the mind as containing faculties, the ability to think, the ability to feel, um, the ability to perceive. And scientists around the turn of the 20th century were very interested in trying to understand the physical basis of those thoughts and feelings. So feelings, in particular, held a very central uh, role in the science. Scientists, though, had a really hard time given the tools uh, and methods that they had. Uh, they weren't really able to find the physical basis of any category of feeling or thought. Uh, and so they moved to the next stage of um, 
of psychological inquiry, which is to basically ignore the mental states completely and just study their causes and consequences. So if you can't find the physical basis of anger or sadness, really what you can do is you can just start studying what causes anger and what the consequences of anger are, and then you can you know, just skip the whole messy part about the mental states kind of in the middle. And from there, it was a very short uh, jump to um, the era of behaviorism, where the mind uh, became uh, irrelevant to psychology completely. So psychologists were no longer interested in mental uh, thoughts and feelings. And mainly, they were just interested in um, stimulus response uh, pairings and measuring behavior. So science became, uh, went from being the, psychology went from being the science of consciousness to the science of behavior. But there was a problem with behaviorism, and it's a problem that every single person in this room knows. And that is that you have thoughts and feelings. You have a mind. Your mind is moving from one, uh, one thought or feeling to another uh, throughout the day. And that the, those um, thoughts and feelings have to be accounted for in scientific terms. And so in the 1950s and 50s and 60s, uh, there was a cognitive revolution in psychology. Uh, and psychology went from being the science of behavior to the science of computation. Scientists were very interested in cognitions, um, how the, the mind worked in terms of um, perceptions and thoughts and decision making and attention. But emotion and feeling, more generally, was completely left out of the equation, really for decades. It was just not considered a serious topic uh, of of uh, science, in part because it, it's such a hard nut to crack. It was just the methods and the, um, the concepts just really weren't available. And of course, eventually, um, the scientists discovered also that they have feelings and that those feelings need to be <laughs> accounted for. Um, and we entered the next phase of um, psychology, which is really the embodiment revolution. The embodiment revolution in psychology is really um, boils down to uh, uh, a, a very simple idea, and that is that sure, you know, you have a brain and you have cognitions that occur in that brain, but um, cognitions occur in a context. That all the thoughts and decisions and actions that you engage in occur in the context of a body that holds the brain. And the body is constantly sending signals to the brain, and those signals pretty much are experienced as feelings. So what does this mean? This means that um, those feelings, which in general we refer to in, in psychology as affect, um, uh, those feelings are important not just, uh, not just to emotions. So affect is not just uh, you know, the six uh, emotions that, um, that people are, are in psychology seem very concerned with. But it's actually every waking moment of your life, uh, you are having some feelings that arise from your body. And those feelings influence a range of different phenomena, not just emotions, but also um, thoughts and decisions and so on and so forth. So affect is more than just emotion. It's actually, broadly speaking, the physical state of the body and any kind of feeling that derives from it, which we usually characterize as having some degree of pleasure or displeasure and um, some degree of arousal. So this includes not just emotion, but also st stress, um, uh, co other kinds of conscious states, um, physical activity, anything where the body is likely to be disrupted and a feeling is likely to result. Um, affect is now we understand not just a, 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 a core um, aspect um, of consciousness, but it actually is an integral ingredient in how the mind works, and specifically how the brain works. And we know um, that, um, that emotion, but also affect more generally, um, is now important not only to the science of the mind, it's important to, um, as practiced in psychology, it's important um, to many sciences, uh, many disciplines. So for example, there are now um, people in um, health-related fields are interested in understanding affect, not just for its role in mental illness, but actually for its role in physical illness. So there are links between affect and um, phenomena that um, illnesses that we know 
we don't typically think of as psychological, like heart disease and diabetes and cancer. So for example, the National Cancer Institute, um, in collaboration with, uh, with some of the people here at Northeastern, just uh, launched a, a major funding initiative to understand the role of affect in uh, cancer um, risk, uh, development progression, and, and mortality. It's also important to um, decision making outside the realm of personal interaction, so things like um, energy use and energy policy. Um, it's very important to um, questions of national uh, interest, like national security. So for example, um, the TSA uh, has a, a behavior detection program called the SPOT program, uh, which they based essentially on affective science. Um, there's been some controversy and some um, uh, testimonies before Congress because the affective science they chose maybe wasn't the most accurate. Um, that's another story. Um, but um, we now know that um, affect is important to, uh, to um, uh, economics. And in fact, um, some people are talking about using an affective quotient to replace uh, gross domestic product as the you know, indicator of the productivity of a nation. Um, Obviously, um, it's interest. It's important. Affect is imp important to. Oh, I'm ahead of myself. Affect is important to education, not just for social uh, behavior, but also affective indices and affective education actually improves math and science test scores. Um, there's a, a really nice project in the New York uh, school system which shows this. Obviously, um, in the workplace, and for anyone who has a child. Uh, in, parenting, even in um, global policy, and in just other sources of industry. So the point here is that um, along with the emergence of this, um, this uh, transition in, in psychology, really what we've seen is a blossoming of interest in emotion and emotion-related topics for a number of phenomena that are traditionally not thought of um, within the purview. Um, of, um, of emotional domain. And then, of course, um, you know, what's m very interesting to many people in this room, the role of emotion and affect more generally in solidifying um, and broadening social networks. Now, it's not just scientists and people in industry who are interested in emotion. In fact, um, if you look at um, indices of, of interest in popular culture, we can see that there are many, many um, uh, books that have been um, published on the topic of emotion, just, or affect, broadly defined, just in the last 10 years. That's only a brief sampling of the, the topics of the books and so on. There are really many. There are a lot of um, uh, media outlets um, which cover stories about affective science and emotion. So um, there was a great um, series produced by Nova called This Emotional Life with our friend Dan Gilbert um, uh, over at Harvard who, um, who was the moderator of that series. There are television shows. Um, there are stories in National Geographic and The New Yorker, and um, there's a great uh, set of um, uh, shows on Radiolab. So collectively, in our consciousness as a culture, um, we are becoming more aware of the role that affect plays. And Northeastern University, in, because it's a very entrepreneurial uh, place, uh, and place where people, as Steve said, you know, work at the boundaries of disciplines, we decided to capitalize on this by developing um, an Affective Science Institute. So with very generous support um, from Northeastern University, uh, we've developed um, a group of faculty who basically, uh, you know, we do the kind of typical academic things that, that faculty do. We have speaker series, we have conferences for each other, we um, try to stimulate um, interdisciplinary uh, research projects. But we also have uh, an emphasis on, on outreach, that is trying to speak to people outside the ivory tower. And this, so far we've had several um, events that we've hosted. The first was um, a, a, com a little uh, conference on um, what we call happy nomics, which was the idea that um, affective science has something to say about um, economics and um, 
Uh, and this was held at the Museum of Science um, about a year and a half ago. We had a second event uh, called Reading the Face, Translating Science into Security. And so this, uh, this workshop was designed to bring to security, the security field, so that would be at members of the TSA and other um, governmental agencies, um, bring to them the, the, um, the newest science of face reading. So um, are emotions universal? Maybe not so much. Do you automatically, like a reflex, recognize the information that's being transmitted in someone's face? Maybe not so much. Maybe it's not so automatic. But science has a lot to say about exactly how people do this, and that might be useful for, to, um, to the security, uh, security industry. And then we've had a third um, event that we hosted in collaboration with the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior on trying to understand um, how uh, models of the mind influence um, courtroom policies and decisions. And so I was there representing um, affect. And of course, today, we have our fourth in our series, which is New Vistas in Emotion and Technology. This is going to prove, I think, to be a very exciting um, day's worth of, of discussion. We're going to hear from some of the best people um, here at Northeastern, but also uh, around the country, um, about the ways that we can bridge affective science and technological advancement to the benefit of both uh, academia and scientific interests and industry. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to, uh, rather than describe to you what the day's events will be, I'm actually going to just turn it over to Andrew, um, who's going to introduce the first session. Oh, I, and I should say, Andrew is uh, the a curator of Pop Tech. Yeah. I took the, the train in from my family's house, and um, the train was late. The affect was poor. Um, <laughs> let's see. I'm going to just do. If it doesn't come up, I'm going to give my uh, introduction as interpretive dance, and you're not going to like it. Um, all right. One more, uh, one more moment. Let's see. Ah, can you all see that? So good morning. Um, it's my, uh, just by very quick introduction, my name is Andrew Zolli. I'm a, the curator and executive director of an organization called PopTech. Um, uh, just coincidentally, I have a degrees in computer science and cognitive neuroscience and in complex systems analysis, and I'm very excited about the three panelists that we're going to be, um, uh, and presenters we're going to be hearing from in this first part of today's discussion, uh, which could not come at a more interesting and important time for us generally as a society, um, <clears throat> in part because uh, what, I, oh dear. Now, my slides are advancing, but they're not changing up there. Let's see. One more time. Sorry, give, give me just a moment. Um, let's see if that helps. Ah, yeah, yes. Because this, friends, was a murder, not a suicide, OK? <laughs> and I want you all to understand that this is the precise gap that all of this important interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work really needs to bridge. It's, it's the measure. The number of hurled objects <clears throat> uh, 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 is uh, in, entirely too high. And the, let's see, the thing I wanted to share with you this morning, I don't know how many of you have heard of or seen this movie. For those of you who haven't, you should, everybody should go see this film. It's a film called Her. It's, about, uh, it's a movie by a, a wonderful filmmaker named Spike Jones. And it's about a man who falls in love with his artificially intelligent operating system. Um, everybody here would fall in love with their artificially intelligent operating system if your artificially intelligent operating system was Scarlett Johansson. Um, <laughs> but what's fascinating about this moment in our culture is that this film could not be made at any other time. It only could be made now. In fact, it's not really a rumination on the future. It's a rumination on the present. It's a rumination on our relationship with technology and the fact that it is remotely plausible that we develop affective relationships with our technology and therefore through our technology, through the platforms and, and structures of our, of our world, um, has become, it's become a plausible premise 
for a cultural dialogue about how we interact. And that is a hugely important shift. It suggests that we are in a moment of something like in a kind of emotional uncanny valley, right? We're at a point where uh, these technologies are quasi-affective in their relationship with us. We, we sort of build uh, slightly autistic relationships with our technology. In fact, I mean, just to give you an example, um, you know, here's a, an example of, a, of an avatar relationship that I had recently, okay? Um, <clears throat> as you can see, she's striking a completely naturalistic pose, and <laughs> she's not looking me in the eye, um, which makes her exactly like many women I have actually met in bars uh, in many cities around the world. And the fact that we could credibly build an emotional relationship, a trusting relationship, a relationship in which we invest emotional and relational capital with a low polygon representation of a human being who has, as a result of the technologies that express her, an extremely limited range of motion is the thing that sets up the plausibility of those kinds of films. And in fact, you can see this bleeding right out of our screens and into real world. I mean, here is another example of a real world low polygon human being <laughs> who has a limited range of emotional expressive capacity and with whom many of us have an ambivalent relationship. And that's a very fascinating thing in itself. But this, one of the things I wanted to suggest to you, and one of the things that I'm paying attention to, that's Joan Rivers, by the way, uh, for those of you. Yeah, see, some people are surprised how, how far Joan Rivers has been modified. Um, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to share with you is a kind of fascinating thing that's happening and a dynamic that outside of the academy, I, my job at uh, run an organization called PopTech and we bring together scientists and technologists and engineers and designers and others to work on breakthrough new approaches to some really intractable challenges. And one of the things that we see in the world of affect as it relates to technology at, across this divide is that we are in a reciprocal and mutually reinforcing relationship, a, a, a mutualistic learning relationship with these technologies. And they are reshaping us. So one of the things that's fascinating about affective computing and in general the story of affective computing is the degree not to which we are training computers to be affective, but the degree to which in some cases those computers are actually changing the affect that we are expressing. And you could see this recently in a wonderful piece in the New uh, Republic, which is about mere punctuation, what's happened to the way in which we communicate, particularly via computer-mediated networks with each other, with via screens and mobile devices. And this, is partic this particular insight was about punctuation, about the use of um, the period, which uh, has become a, an incredibly passive-aggressive piece of punctuation. Um, if, in the context of communicating with another human being, you say, uh, no, Right? Do you want to go to the movies? No. And what does that actually mean? Well, no, in this case, means, as we all know in university land, no means no. And, but if you append a period to the end of that, it means no, asshole. <laughs> and the conversation is over. Now, when the precise moment that the period became something that meant that, and not just merely I've concluded a sentence, is an interesting question, but it certainly happened within the window within which we are reshaping our emotional lives through screens. And that is important because in the extreme cases, in extreme cases, affect has a huge implication on the way in which we interact with each other, tiny implications. And I learned this um, expressly in a big project that PopTech's been involved with, uh, started in Chicago, in, in which this guy, who's a, an, an epidemiologist named Gary Slutkin, built an incredible organization that uh, treats the spread of violence as if it were a communicable disease. It's sort, of, it's sort of an affective disorder, right? It's a pathology of affect, the spread of violence. Um, and this is particularly interesting in places where extreme violence occurs, like in Kenya in 2007. This is the elections in, in, which were plagued by 
incredibly intimate violence that was itself primarily spread from community to community via mobile devices. And the affective content of those messages, either incented or disincented, incredibly intimate levels of violence. So understanding the degree to which we, cast, we both present and reflect and read affect through devices has real world consequences. People live and die. And at least give great examples of all of these other industries in which it matters, but it also matters in humanitarian causes. And in, in fact, actually, it led us to this wonderful piece of work in which we're using mobile devices and very carefully considered affective behavioral change Chains, chains of messages to suppress the spread of violence on the assumption that it's actually, those same devices are also being used to spread it, so a sort of counter narrative. The other place that I'd encourage us to think, and just one of the places that I'm paying attention is, is around this work. Um, in addition to learning how to build more uh, effective virtual humans, we're also learning about our emotional lives through these devices. This is one of my favorite uh, applications. It's called Experial, and it's a real-time uh, application that five times a day it asks you your emotional state and allows you to essentially draw with your finger a sort of kinesthetic on a kinesthetic wheel how you're feeling at that moment and then plot it over time and because we're Americans you can compete with your friends for who has the best affect. Um, I'm winning. So all of these questions, how do we learn to trust one another? when mediated through technology? How do we uh, build uh, synthetic systems, digital virtual systems, that uh, cross the uncanny valley and bolster our humanity and allow us to build real relationships? That's the subject of this first discussion. And we have three terrific presenters from right here at uh, Northeastern uh, in three different areas. Uh, to come at those questions, and you're going to meet them right now. Uh, Stacy Marcella, uh, David Deseno, who, whom you heard from a moment ago, and, and Maggie uh, Saif El Nasser. Uh, and I'll introduce them each in turn, but let me start with, uh, with Stacy. Uh, Stacy uh, Marcella from USC recently landed, I mean, I think within days uh, of, of today uh, here at Northeastern uh, from uh, doing work on, at the Institute for uh, Creative Technologies at USC. Uh, where he's done pioneering work uh, in uh, how we build genuine virtual humans that look and feel and interact like, they present like human beings, uh, is going to talk to us a little bit about how we inject warm-bloodedness into uh, the digital lizard class, which are our avatars. And so I'm, with that, uh, will you please join me in welcoming Stacy Marcella up to the, the podium. <laughs> 